The man everybody was afraid of. A Dave Branstetter mystery. Book four in the series. Author Joseph Hansen. Publisher Open Road Integrated Media New York. Narrator Eric Ost. Chapter six. Shop fronts of raw planks faced the bay. A crooked wooden deck followed the curve of the shore and hung over the water. Its railings were two by fours. Painted white, sets of board steps. Painted white dropped maybe ten feet to moorings. Where sail and power fletcher craft bumped. Clean gunwales further out on the bright blue water. Bigger boats rocked at anchor. Slim catches scarred fishing boats. Launches lofty with superstructure. Under slices of colored sail, skiffs tilted, filled with kids. Widows in sun hats and sleeveless dresses sipped chilled white wine and ate sole in cream sauce at shaded tables in front of a restaurant whose sign pictured a cartoon fish in a sombrero. The place called itself El Pascadero. The sign on the next shop was shaped like a pallet and promised art supplies. But the door was locked. He rattled it. No one came. He shaded his eyes with his hands and peered through the window. Reflections of the water rippled on the ceiling. Bad seascapes repeated themselves on walls covered with burlap. No one stirred his mouth, tightened, and he turned away. He'd just come from another locked door. Ophelia R. Green's 127 Poppy Street, one of a straggle of shacks under heavy-headed old peppered trees in a tuck of the hills on the far side of the highway. He'd wrapped a door that was a flimsy wooden frame for bulging squares of screen. He'd waited on the warped boards of a little stoop in the hot sun. When she hadn't come, he'd walked around back, where the yard went up steeply, flowers smiled. There were tidy rows of cabbages, onions, tomato plants. A slap-up garage was half dug into the slope. Its door scraped weedy ground when he pulled it open. Bunches of dried flower bulbs hung from the rafters, trailing tatters of brown paper sack. Underfoot, not an oil leak or tire track showed that a car had ever sheltered here. Against a wall leaned a motorcycle covered by a tarp. Dust rose sluggishly and made him cough. When he lifted the tarp, the machine was shiny, but its tires were flat. He went out into the sunlit again and shut the weary door. A screen porch hung off the back of the house. He climbed three steps and peered inside. A washing machine stood there, the old kind, with ringers, rumpled clothes lay on top of it. Jockey shorts, tank tops, jeans. He went down the steps in the next yard, where tall hollyhocks swayed a shriveled Mexican woman milked a goat. Dave asked her in Spanish where La Senora Green was. La Negra cleaned the house of someone unknown. She would be home at supper time. La Hora de Sinar. He'd like to have seen her first, but he couldn't use the afternoon. If he could find paints, he went down a passageway into a patio where a jacaranda tree spread feathery shade and strewed the red paving tiles with blue blossoms. The shops facing the tree had been fitted with raw wooden fronts, too. From their exposed rafter ends, fishnets hung in swags, ponchos, serrates, small rugs, made color in one window. The framework of a loom rose behind them. In the next window, handcrafted silver set with turquoise lay on artfully crumpled velvet. A third window showed hand-tooled leather goods, sandals, bags, belts, and a window in a corner watercolors hung against a panel covered in monk's cloth. The subjects were predictable. Boats, gulls, rickety piers. He made the locus Monterey, but the drawing and brushwork were better than good, and the eye had seen honestly. Above the pictures, a signature was brushed large on a card. Tire Smith. On the window glass, fresh gilt lettering read, Motor Windrow Gallery. The signboard overhead had been painted out with white, but he could see what had been lettered on it. 
Beachcomber, complete line of artist needs. It had been. He shrugged and went inside. The walls were freshly painted, oyster white. On one hung a dozen more tire smiths. On another, Mexican tin masks. The back wall, except where a door broke it, was floor to ceiling shelves of shiny new artworks. Some of them turned to show their front covers. One was the history of Mexican art he'd seen in Ben Orton's study. The open floor space was carpeted in oyster white. Big terracotta pre-Columbian figures squatted on top of plywood pedestals wrapped in monk's cloth. Spotlit. He didn't see any glass counter of art supplies, only a new desk where no one sat. The door in the bookshelf wall opened and a man came out. He carried a splintered pine board that looked like part of a crate. A jimmy was in his other hand. Wisp of straw clung to his beard. Dave knew art gallery types, and this man wasn't one of them. He was strong and hard, and his skin wasn't beach tanned. It was tan, like leather. His beard might or might not ever have been trimmed. A twisted and knotted bandana kept his long hair black. He wore a flimsy cotton shirt, not made in the USA, and jeans not faded by the manufacturer. He didn't speak, his brows thick and black and straight above startling blue eyes. Did the questioning, Dave said, Did you buy the stock too? It's still here. He jerked his head. And back. The shop at the waterfront is closed. I need a couple of tubes of paint and a brush. I don't know anything about it, the man said, but he went out and came back with cardboard cartons. He turned one over and paint tubes and little boxes of paint tubes rattled out on the desk. Out of the other, he dumped paper-taped clumps of brushes. Help yourself. He stood back against the bookshelves and began to make a cigarette out of a zigzag paper and bugler tobacco. His fingers were thick and the blackness under the nails suggested he worked with machinery. When Dave chose slim tubes of black and white and a small sable brush, he said, No colors? What do I owe you? Dave asked. The man didn't hear. He was staring into the patio where voices were raised. Dave turned. Three of the sun-hatted widows crossed under the jacaranda tree, making for the hand weaver's shop. The voices weren't theirs. They swung around to stare at a pair who had come to a halt just inside the patio. The man was frail and white-haired and wore a linen suit, yellow with age, and the woman was gypsy dark in beads, sandals, a granny dress, hair around her head and thick braids. The man leaned at her, shouting, So I signed a paper. We're supposed to be friends. Tyree, shut up, darling. There's nothing to say. The man wants the pictures. I sold him the pictures. You gave me that right, she walked off. Not for pennies. I didn't, he caught her, turned her. I came back from the dead to paint those pictures. Two thousand dollars, he laughed. But there was a sob in it. A baseball player gets more than that for taking a deep breath. She twisted his hands. He wouldn't let go. You promised me a show. Two years I waited. I lived on that promise. You lived on vodka. She jerked free and came for the gallery. The flat soles of the sandals slapping the tiles. He lunged after her. He looked unsteady, but she refused to run, and he got her again only steps from the gallery door. Since you didn't notice, he snarled, I wasn't happy sweeping the floor, swabbing the john, framing doms for lay tourists. He saw the widows gapping and stuck out his tongue at them. I have talent. Remember? I kept my promise. She tugged a hand loose and waved it at the window where the watercolors hung. There's your show for anyone to see. Only no one cares. Darn, can't you get that through your head no one is buying are you saying they're bad he looked as if she'd knocked the wind out of him he let her go his next words begged and had tears in them you don't mean that mona she rubbed her arms where he'd gripped them 
She tried to be calm and kind. I mean, they're too good for this location. That's why I set up this lunch with Costoros. He can sell them. They'll hang in nice homes. Santa Barbara, Malibu, Beverly Hills. They'll be looked at and admired. Tyre, I was doing you a favor. What do you want from me? It's been a long, long time since you had $2,000 in a lump. He'll get 10000 20 That greasy Greek queen. An interior decorator, for God's sake. Why? What talent has he got? Why should a nothing like that... The bearded man had walked to the gallery door. Now he left it and stood in front of the fragile old man. Go sober up, he said. Smith shrank a little, but he didn't go. Franklin, this is your doing. You and your Mexican monstrosity. Do you know what those represent? A religion that cut the hearts out of living men. But of course you know that. That would suit you, Al. Just your style. Where do you keep that boat of yours? He glanced around as if to find it dry docked in one of the empty shops. I'd like to bore a hole in it. Go sleep it off, Franklin said. You're heading back to Monterey, remember? Those barroom buddies you miss so much. You can't pull a trailer on the coast road drunk. The woman had already come into the gallery. Al Franklin followed and shut the door. Tyree Smith stood teetering for a minute, staring after them with unfocused eyes. Then he staggered off. Sorry about that, Franklin said to Dave. I'd buy that one. Dave indicated a sketch of pitted sea rock steepled with lesion, where a crab shell lay bleaching in the sun. I'm sorry, the woman said. They're all sold. That's how it sounded. Dave held out the little paint tubes and the brush. How much for these? Take them, she said, and went out the door in the bookshelf wall. Dave looked at Franklin. Franklin raised the thick eyebrows again. She's the boss, he said. Dave glanced at the terracottas apologetically. I doubt that I can afford to buy one of those to make it up to you. Franklin shrugged. Forget it, he said. The motel was new and hung over the marina. He stood at the glass wall drying off after a quick shower and watched sunbrown kids with sunbleached hair topple off. Little catamarans and clamber aboard again. He hung the red, white, and blue towel up and combed his hair. Laid his suitcase on a red, white, and blue bedspread and took from the suitcase blue denims, which he kicked into. A star-spangled styrofoam tub of ice cubes had arrived while he showered. He dropped cubes into a clear plastic glass, dug a fifth of old crow from the suitcase, and made himself a stiff drink. He lit a cigarette, sat in the bed, and dialed a red, white, and blue telephone. While he waited for the desk nurse to fetch Amanda, he took two long swallows from the glass. He's the same, she said. The doctor says that's good. It could turn around, Dave. It could. Hold the thought, he said. She was very young. He told her where to reach him, reading the number off the dial black. It looks as if I'll be here a while. The situation is extremely phony. Unless you need me, it will be just as phony when I get back to it. Call tonight, she said and sounded lonesome. I'd planned on around six, he said. Maybe he can talk to you then, she said. If he's conscious, he'll want to talk to you. I'll want to talk to him, Dave said. After he'd hung up, he dug the brush and tubes of paint from the jacket of his sweated suit. He slipped from the brown envelope marked KDSC TV. The photo of Ben Orton and laid it on the stingy motel room desk. He filled another plastic glass with water and sat at the desk to work on the photo. To change Ben Orton's image, give it a curly long hair look under the slouch brim leather hat, put mirror goggles on it, paint out the necktie, and open the collar. The desktop was white for Micah. He mixed his shades of gray on it. When he'd finished, it wiped off easily. He dropped brush and paints into the drawer. He let the photo lie on the desk to dry, and he used the phone again. Pets, 
Doug Sawyer's voice said. He was the neat, gray-haired man Dave lived with in big, awkward, sunny rooms above Doug's new art gallery on Robertson. But today, as for many days past, he was at his mother's shop in a gritty, run-down corner of Los Angeles between a bicycle shop and a beauty shop. He was selling off the stock to other dealers. Food bags of kibble, bins of birdseed, fixtures, cages, fish tanks, counters, racks, refrigerators. While his plump, beaky little mother sat blankly, hands in lap, in the small house in back of the shop where Doug had grown up, her mind was failing. It was a blood circulation problem medicine couldn't do anything about. She tried to keep going with the shop, but animals, birds, fish were nothing you could do absent-minded about. Or crazy. Doug had his own business to run, but unless he checked on her every day, food and water might not be supplied to the cages. Small lives would go out like matches in a wind. It was far to travel. Los Angeles is wide, and now she'd begun to neglect herself, forgetting to eat, to wash, to go to bed. Twice she'd lost her way on little trips to the supermarket and to the bank. Police had brought her home on lucid days. She tried to be cheerful, but it had begun to frighten her. It had frightened Doug for quite a while. Are you all right? Dave asked. She set bacon grease on fire this morning, Doug said. If I hadn't got here when I did, the house would have burned. It's 94 degrees in L.A., and people aren't keeping appointments, and tomorrow I'll be tied up getting her into the rest home. Where are you? Dave told him and read him the phone number. What does it look like? Will you be gone forever? Not if a lady keeps lying who has no talent for it, Dave said. I saw some pre-Columbian pieces today that would make you drool. You're joking. Where? They're impossible to get. You know that? Since the Mexican government cracked down. A little gallery here. Big ones. Beauties. You're sure? For sale? Not just an exhibit? I didn't ask. I'll check if I have time. Sure you will, Doug said. How's your father? And when Dave told him, he asked, Do you want me to go to the hospital? If I were there, I'd take Amanda to dinner, Dave said, but you've got enough problems. Yours, you can run away from, Doug said. I can't help him, Dave said. Look, I asked you this morning, did you want me to stay? Forget it, Doug said. It's nerves. It's the heat. I'm better off working, Dave said. That's, that's all. Work already? Doug said and hung up. Dave pushed his feet into rope-soled shoes and pulled over his head a denim tunic with white rope laces. He locked the number door and carried the photo in its envelope along the deck and down to street level. The silver Electra waited in its numbered slot beneath the building with a half dozen other cars, but it set too low. He frowned at the tires, flat. He stepped to the other side of the car, again flat. He crouched and ran a hand over the near one, slashed. He stood, turned, used past in baggy flowered trunks, portering surfboards on their heads. A fat man in a cloth hat led a small girl by the hand. Both of them licked ice cream cones. Sun flared off cars, crowning the curbs. Across the street, one car had a police badge painted on its door. Raising a hand, Dave started for it and it pulled out, fast, tires shrieking, and five seconds it had skidded out of sight, around a corner, but Dave's mind kept a picture, under his badge cap and dark glasses, the driver had been grinning, straight at him. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word, so this effort is twofold to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew, reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.